All right. I hate to interrupt your conversations, but I call the house to order. Now, Clara, where is Clara? She left. Okay, so I noticed that we, uh, that we um, ran six minutes over time, the last panel. So I would be very disappointed if we can't beat that, right? Okay, guys, buckle up because we have a very, very cool lineup. Um, before I introduce you, I want to give you a very short uh, uh, summary or, or introduction to its subject because it's, it's amaz amazingly broad. Um, if you read the news these days, you can't help but find yourself in the middle of a revolution, it seems. Uh, ever since the arrival of ChatGPT, the pages of newspapers have been swept blank as if by a hurricane just to make room for all kinds of discussions. Uh, uh, some of them center around the very question of are we witnessing the arrival of artificial general intelligence? Uh, some form of intelligence that some people claim is far superior to ours. Um, the debate and the speed of the debate sometimes is so intense that it almost feels like if you don't feel dizzy yet, uh, you may not be sufficiently informed. But what are we really talking about? Uh, what should we talk about? Uh, is it lights out for everyone, as uh, Sam Altman just recently said in front of Congress? Or is it, as Demis Hassabi, the CEO of uh, uh, Google's DeepMind said, uh, the radical abundance, the age of radical abundance, he said. Do the people close to the subject really uh, think that it's the end of humanity, as uh, Geoffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI, said? Or is it akin to worrying about the problems of overpopulation on Mars, as an engineer just said? Uh, maybe it's just the wrong framing, the wrong analogy. Or is ChatGPT aching to the two fours that the French poet Paul Valéry once described when he said, the cyclone is able to sweep away an entire city, but not even to unseal a letter or to untie uh, a knot of a string? Well, we're going to find out, and while I'm very confident that we will conclusively uh, dis uh, um, uh, discuss, able to, to, uh, to discuss this in under 40 minutes, uh, let's, <laughs> let's rather... Let's rather frame this discussion as a starting point. So in any way, I'm incredibly proud of the lineup we have here today, uh, not only because our guests are able to, uh, to um, approach these questions from various angles, from academia and, and business, but also, as you will uh, very soon learn, do this in a very, very humorous and very colorful way. So please give a round of applause to our guests, uh, Dr. Joanna Bryson, Chris Wars, and Dr. Gerald Friedland. Now, it's, I want to introduce you. Um, it's always quite a challenge because you all have so, you've done so much. But I try to keep it very brief. Okay, Joanna, you're a professor of ethics and technology at the Hertie School. Uh, you focus your research on the impact of technology on human cooperation and I, uh, AI ICT governance. Uh, prior, you were on the computer science faculty of the University of Bath. You have been affiliated with the Department of uh, Psychology at Harvard University, the Department of Anthropology at the University of Oxford, the School of Social Science at the University of Mannheim, and Princeton Center of in in Information Technology Policy. I I'm, I'm very sure I, I, I left something out. Um, you wrote your PhD on the confusion generated by anthrop anthropomorphized, oh my god, quite, quite a handful, AI, and judging from your blog, you have a keen eye. Uh, not only for the many statements that are currently being issued, but even more so for the intentions and skewed worldviews of those who issue them. So, watch out. Uh, Chris, you're truly a jack of all trades. You earned your degree in computer science, advised the German federal government under Chancellor Angela Merkel. You're also an advisor to numerous firms, including Deutsche Telekom and Hereos. You are the founder and CEO of IT company Arago, which uh, deals with implementation of artificial intelligence. You're a speaker, you're an author, uh, you are still heavily involved in research, and now in a minute you can tell us uh, how graph theory and your passion for horse riding can benefit from each other. <laughs> but before, I'd uh, like to introduce our third guest. Now, Gerald, I think if I would ha have had the pleasure of having you as my teacher, because I watch your YouTube videos, 
I probably would have opted for a decent education. Um, you are a fabulous teacher of data science at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, you were one of the initiate initiators for the release of the YFCC100M <laughs> corpus, the largest research collections of images and videos for research. Uh, it contains 100 million images and one, uh, one million videos, and you're still the maintainer of that corpus working uh, closely with Amazon. Uh, now, given you're a master of martial arts, I will assure you that I will leave all the critical questions for the other two. <laughs> um, but I won't spare you because you have the most important part now, because you can, uh, you can now help us to understand what AGI, art artificial general intelligence, is, uh, and then I will take it from there to discuss what ChatGPT or why ChatGPT is being perceived as a precursor of AGI. So I'm sure you can do this in a sentence. What is AGI? Okay. So, um, in fact, I would... Oh. Hello, yeah, hi. So in fact, I would love to do it in a sentence because as a scientist, I like to go off a definition. And of course, a definition narrows you and then people are against the definition and that's a good discussion to have. But if you're without a definition, we usually go, it's hard to get anywhere. So intelligence has been defined a long time ago. Um, and by Binet and Simon, if you take a current IQ test, it's a Stanford Binet test, by the way. Now, this has been very politicized, let's not go there. But they defined intelligence as the, the ability to adapt. Now, that's an incredibly general definition. Um, and I think for machine learning, for our purposes, we're going to have to specialize a little more by making it a little longer and saying uh, intelligence is the ability to adapt to new tasks. And then we can define general AI as being, well, any task. And now it's going to be difficult because podcasts can we even think of, right? But it is interesting, obviously, that ChatGPT is able to both pass the bar, which is the lawyer exam in the US, as well as being one percentile in the, Olympia, uh, in the, in the Olympics for biologists. And I wonder which human can do that, right? So that makes it more intelligent in some ways. Now, in other ways, it's difficult. And now we have to understand what are humans' ability to adapt to new tasks or new environments? And I think of three that I can think of. One is genetics. Our genes adapt us, sort of, every generation, and even epigenetics helps us with that. That's genetic adaptation. The second adaptation is the neural adaptation. Everything we think of intelligence is kind of like our brain, right? But that's really just day to day. Our brain is their evolutionary so that we, you know, don't fall down a cliff. Um, and then there's this third adaptation that most people don't think of, but it's extremely interesting and understudied and really relevant to ChatGPT, which is what I call memetic intelligence. That is the part of intelligence that makes our society be able to create a vaccination against COVID while any individual is not able to. There's no single person who could single-handedly create a vaccination against COVID. Yet, we were out adapting the virus by doing that as a society. And that is the interesting part about ChatGPT because we collected sort of the memetic knowledge, you know, knowledge, sort of communication makes memetic intelligence possible. And the memetic knowledge is sort of stored as a, to a first degree stored in ChatGPT. To a first degree, I see, by the way, ChatGPT just as an advanced version of Google, okay? We store the knowledge and generalize from it and she's just storing it. So, Yes, in that sense, uh, we have a more general AI because we sort of see the, the snippets of, of society and then of the memetic adaptation as of the cutoff date of September 2021. In another sense, we don't because uh, our society will adapt and ChatGPT will have to catch up with it, right? So that's the quick answer. But... <laughs> All right, uh, let's see if you can give us an even quicker answer, Joanne. Oh. Uh, you recently wrote that using, uh, and, and because I want to come back to, to ChatGPT, using LLMs, which are large language models, um, to answer open-ended questions is an abuse of intelligent technology. Uh, LLMs are and will always be by nature magic eight balls. I don't know if you remember what magic eight balls are. These are like, they, they look like a billiard ball and if you shake them, they give you an answer, which are applicable to pretty much everything. Um, so this doesn't sound intelligent at all. <laughs> uh, 
what do you mean by that? And can you give us a really short idea? Because I'm, I'm sure not everybody is familiar with, with large language models, what ChatGPT and its underlying architecture oh. is. Okay, because the other part wasn't fa hard enough. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks so much for having me here. I loved the previous panel. This is great. Um, okay, so let me answer the question because we only have so much time. The, um, so what uh, ChatGPT is, is uh, well, as was just said, one we do with large language models is that we look out and see how other people have used language. Now the other generative AI, like we were hearing about with art and music, you can do this with lots of things. But basically, there was a, a question a long time ago, which is like, what, what could a word even mean? And there was like Wittgenstein or somebody said, oh, a word means how we use it. And everyone's like, yeah, sounds like a philosopher, right? It turns out, but it turns out it's true. It's really interesting. We, this is coming back to this mimetic idea. We have evolved a set of ways, and here I mean mimetically evolved. We've, we as a culture have come together, pulled up, and chosen sets of words. I mean, different cultures choose different sets. As you might notice, I'm a native English speaker, right? But, but a lot of the concepts that have proven useful, we, we transfer around and whatever. Okay, it turns out that we have webs of these concepts, and you can get unbelievable amounts of information about how the world works from looking just at the context that the words exist in. So in 2017, I was one of those people that had that paper that you might have read about that showed that uh, AI trained this way is exactly as sexist and racist as we are, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Because it turns out that, um, and I wouldn't have thought to do this, it was my idea that large language models might capture what was called implicit bias. As soon as I learned about how easy it is to measure implicit bias, I thought, I bet we could find those on large language models. But it was my co-author's idea that said, well, he was up for tenure, which is a big deal in America. You're like, going to lose your job, right? <laughs> so he said, I want to see how this could, uh, checks with the real world. It turns out our implicit biases reflect our lived experience. It's just true that there's more women nurses and fewer women who are, who are uh, programmers. In fact, one of the things I found devastating about this work was finding out how few women are programmers now. I was a programmer in the 80s when it was like 13%. It peaked around 17. It was down around 4% in like 2008. It's really depressing. Anyway. Programming is a lot of fun if you're a woman. I recommend it strongly. Anyway, everyone, I, I, anyway, sorry. So the point about the magic eight ballness now is that, so, so that was just single words, but you can also connect the worlds together. Okay, there, you have chat GPT. <laughs> All right. It's a little more than that because you can look at the ways that the words are connected together at different levels. And I think that's what's freaking out. And, and indeed, to one of the questions asked earlier, there are definitely some of our colleagues who work for big companies uh, who are terrified. So I, I and I, I as my first degree was actually psychology. Oh, and my PhD was actually systems engineering. That was just a paper I wrote as a student paper during my PhD, the one about anthropomorphism. But really I did, how do you build human-like AI? That was my <laughs> PhD, right? Well, to make it easier, it was basically object-oriented engineering of, of AI. Anyway, sorry, I digress too much. The point is that the magic eight ballness out of it comes that we, when we say something, usually have some reason. And you can hear me, I'm one of those people with a problem that I have too many reasons and I hop between them quickly and I can be confusing, right? But for, for a GPT, it has no reason except the sort of the random situation you're in, right? There, there's nothing, there's no motivated, there's no you know, parents, there's no history, all the stuff we were hearing about before. There isn't that, except to the extent that it's a giant library of our entire culture. Right? And so I think that's why people can scare themselves. I don't know if you heard about Replica, but there was this thing where um, people were training, they were trying to train their partners. The whole idea that you have your best friend or your, or your lover your, or your spouse, an AI that you own and that you get to train, like that is not partnership, right? That is not fair, right? But anyway, some people were doing this and they had left their human lover because of an abusive relationship, and then they found the AI replicating the, the abuse, also abusing them, okay? Well, that's because a lot of these patterns, these bad patterns, you can find them in the culture. 
And so when the, when the, unfortunately, the victim was still saying the kinds of things that the victim kind of said, the AI easily filled in what the abuser of victims tend to say. That wasn't hard, right? So the magic eight ball, when you're a little kid, you know, you sit around and it says, you know, will I ever get married? And it says, oh, the future is unclear or most likely, you know, or whatever. And you sit and you go, oh, wow, you know, I don't know. But if you say, does my mommy like me? Right? And, it, and half the answers are no, right? Because it's like half yes and half no. Like, you basically learn that you shouldn't say, does my mommy like you? Does her mommy like her? You know, should I kill myself? There's certain questions you don't ask magic eight balls. And so that's what I meant, it was abusive technology. That, that we're trying to pretend there's a person there that we can really have a conversation with is a problem. So, thank you for the long answer. We definitely get closer to the goal of uh of uh, getting the six minutes, getting, getting more of the six minutes over time. Um, let me come back to, you, to what, you, what you just said, uh, Chris. And now I want to I want to come close to the debate that I was uh, briefly touching on uh, the letters. Everybody writes letters right now. Um, and by the way, Wittgenstein also said uh, the easiest way is through the door. And why is no one taking it? Uh, so let's. Let's uh, let's let's have a look at the at the um, at the letters, Chris. I, I'm going to use some something that Joanna said uh, to quiz you. Joanna just wrote on LinkedIn about the current developments. I quote: "Time wasted arguing about fantasies is time not spent thinking about the real issues." So, do you share that opinion? And if so, let's start with the fantasies. Uh, <laughs> if AGI is nowhere near, why do you see why do we see these letters? Just as a reminder, because I, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar, uh, in, in the latest letter, it was a one-sentence letter that just has been published and signed by many leading AI folks, and it, and, and it reads, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be global priority alongside other uh, so, 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 I always get that wrong. Suicidal. Suicidal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, risk, such as pandemics and nuclear war. Uh, after all, it's not just Sam Altman who signed that letter. Uh, you may think that he may benefit from it in some way or the other. It's also people like Geoffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI, so, uh, who publicly regrets some of his lifetime achievements. Why would they do this? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely question, okay. Um, <laughs> so. I think this is complete bullshit. I'm, I'm sorry to say this. And, and, and what you read in these letters is pure marketing. Let's take the first letter that came out, right, that was initiated by Elon Musk. And he's saying, like, we should all stop training AI uh, in order to make none of the AIs better than his. <laughs> that, worked, that worked a long time ago when they created PayPal, right? Elon Musk was one of the, one of the people oppressively against online banking. And then he created PayPal, or was one of the creators of PayPal, and said, like, look, if I do it, you know how I feel about it. If I do it, it must be okay. And he's doing exactly the same fucking thing again, uh, because it worked the first time. Um, the second one, um, I, I think this is really funny that you say that the godfather of AI, let's debate who that really is, but uh, denounces some of his work because he says there's, there's a huge risk. There's a huge risk in... in this applying this type of AI, but it's not because of the technology, it's because of the shallowness of us. Like if some statistical process can reproduce an, a bar exam, as, as you had, uh, or, or a whatever exam, and it is perfect, or write an essay that is acceptable in school, it just means that we're no, no longer good enough to create something that an AI will not, that statistically will not happen. I mean, there are so many problems with these type of, of uh, large language models. I think uh, you've described it nicely. They're, they're a good store of knowledge, and you can have, personally, I think it's a fantastic technology, and we should use it to finally get rid of keyboard and mouse because uh, there's a much better way in, in making computers accessible to or compute accessible to anyone. Um, and believe me, I know what I'm talking about. I personally, I was researching at the NCSA and I, I personally told Mark Andreessen that no one would need a web browser. Because I believed, I thoroughly believed that you could use a computer and a command line just as good. What I didn't see is um, that there are many people 
people out there who didn't like the command line at all, and they preferred the browser. And I think even more people prefer language. But that we're outsourcing the primary human task of creating something new, collecting new experiences, that is just, A, it's not possible, um, because statistic never creates anything new, right? I mean, if, if, if we fed Galileo's world into a, an LLM, the world would still be flat because there was very statistically nothing out there uh, that would say that the, the world is round, but there was a lot of causal and evidence chain that, that we could argue, we used to argue that the world is round. So I think actually generating contact, content that way really is, makes us look very stupid. And if we really go down that route of making ourselves more stupid and more stupid and more stupid, then I think, yeah, there is an existential risk, right? But that has nothing to do with the technology. Um, it has something to do that maybe we want to live in this movie called Idiocracy. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna come back because that's a very interesting thing you just said. Uh, and you, and you, were, you were trying to, to turn the discussion we're having right now away from technology more to the human side. Uh, I will come to that. But I don't let you, uh, let you out of that, that easy. Um, and I don't let you answer the next question. <laughs> That's for you, Gerald. Um, so Chris said he has been wrong uh, one time. Why, why can we assume that he isn't wrong now? So may, uh, this is, so can we, I mean, is it a fundamental problem that we cannot overcome for whatever reason? Or is it that, uh, that we just don't, don't, we're not creative enough right now, we don't see how that could evolve? And, and one other question, Dan Hendricks, who's the executive director of the Center of AI Safety, uh, um, the institution that just issued the, the letter that everybody signed, except you. <laughs> um, so he Look, said that. I'm sorry, Jan, I've got, I've got to go into this because the people who actually run the large models, like uh, yeah. Jan from Facebook, and, uh, and, and um, they have not signed the letter. Well, the, the, right. Right? Do I mean, we get to Sam fight Alban about did. this? Yeah, no, no, not just that. But Yasha Bengio, so I know Yasha Bengio, I know Jeff Hinton, I know, I know Dan Dennett, right? Some people who do work on this, you can't generalize. There's some of these guys. I agree. I think Jan's more right than Yashua about this, but uh, but anyway, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, but 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 it's it, it it it's still an interesting question. Is that something where we just feel like we don't have the compute power, we don't have the means right now to overcome a problem, or even come to? Stay? Is it even desirable? Could be could be an interesting question, right? But then Hendricks, who's the executive director of that uh, institution, he said in an interview that the open letter represent, represented a coming out, which I found very interesting to say, uh, of some industry leaders. He said that it would be very common misconception uh, that there are only a handful of doomers. Um, Gerald, as you work in, in <laughs> at the University of Berkeley, um, is that true? Is yeah. that, do, have you just not, have you not dared to come out yet? So, uh, I am, yeah, this is a good question. Dear to my heart, there's a bunch of things, um, some things I can't even talk about, but let's talk about this first of all. Um, the open letter. Um, so, uh, it's not going to happen. So, the, 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 interesting, the interesting problem that we face with ChatGPT is that it is prone to replace the work of junior people. Okay, so you, you still have to do quality control with whatever comes out of it. Um, also, ChatGPT4, by the way, has been, I was part of the first release, and since then has been toned down. They actually took features out. You, you used to be able to go and say, um, uh, please uh, create, me the, uh, create me an eagle file for, you know, this is getting very specific, that's why I'm saying it this way. Please create me an eagle file for a timer. And yes, you would get an actual eagle file. Now, most people don't know what an eagle file is. An eagle file is actually uh, a CAD program for circuits. That means I can load this file, as is from ChatGPT, into a CAD program and send it to China, and what I can get back is a circuit board right away. I don't have to do anything. Of course, I should do some quality control, but again, that is the work of a senior person. 
So that is the, the big problem, the, the society, societal problem that I see with uh, ChatGPT especially is that the work of junior people goes away and then the only quality control is left, which is usually the work of senior peoples. And that is also not new. You know, the work of a secretary went away when word came about, we could correct instead of typewriter. And also there's a lot of less editorship now that we have autocorrect in word. By the way, when you were asked, who did you say I? All hands should have gone up autocorrect is AI, okay? You, you don't just use word anymore? I don't know, I mean, that could be true too. Anyway, having said that, the problem here, and this is the, why we're talking about the letter, is the quickness uh, that how, how this happened. So we, we are looking at when the internet came, when the computer came, right? There's the book called The Digital Hand that was already perceived as an extremely fast transition within generation, one generation that the computer was introduced. Then the internet came and there was an extremely fast transition. And now we have sort of from one day to the other, which is also not true, the perception is from one day to the other, from one day to the other AI technology. And the problem here is there's something called technical diffusion. And it takes a while until technology gets adopted and we find new jobs, for example, we create new jobs and so on and so forth. And that is the danger and that is the, the part of the letter. What I find a much bigger danger, and this is all the people actually that I, that I talked to here, the experts uh, all agree on this, um, is our educational system and not in, in terms even of application, but even in terms of the engineers who create it, Okay, so there's very few books these days that actually aim at understanding what we're creating here. It's mostly, hey, use this tool and the tool will do it for you. And then you go and ask the creators of this tool and they say, well, we just did whatever other people did. And then you go further, 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 further and you find out nobody actually knows what they were doing anymore. And that is a much, much, much bigger problem. And there's actually even a whole movement within you know, Silicon Valley to like, no, we don't need education on AI, we just need more CPU or GPU, and that is dangerous. That is the bigger danger because I find that actually, by the way, highly unethical. We should understand the technology that we're building so somebody can be made responsible for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is very interesting because um, uh, at times, in, in, or in former times, you, you could have said like, uh, we deal with expert systems, right? Uh, a layman may not know what's happening within these systems, but the experts do. But now, uh, ChatGPT, I think somebody said it's, it's like a great equalizer. <laughs> um, but it, not in a very positive way, uh, but in a sense that the layman's don't know what's going on, but the experts don't know either, right? Uh, so it isn't, like, isn't the question of AGI being a godlike compute thing whatsoever distracting from the fact that um, we should we should be more concerned about that nobody knows exactly what's going on and we just let it roam. Joan? I, I would love to come in here. So, so part of the reason that I'm in Berlin now is because I do think that governance is one of the biggest problems and I hadn't started there. In fact, I, I self-identify as a natural scientist. I'm really interested in how intelligence works. You can find my biology papers if you want. But it's hard if there are ways down <laughs> because the AI ethics has really taken off. Um, so I, I just, I, I, I want to slightly, uh, so what some of my colleagues like Yasho Bengio, absolutely his, my, his, his heart is in the right place. He's a super smart person. Jeff Hinton, super, super, super smart person, right? But they haven't done any social science. They don't know the history of political science. They don't know that the problems that they're now seeing are the problems we've always had. Right. So, so these these are they're, they're um, you know when you the, this thing super intelligence. So one of the, the letters I loved from it wasn't a letter it was a blog from Sal Altman and two of his colleagues said you know we've been talking about AGI but that's not the real problem. The real problem is super intelligence. Actually, I agree. Okay, artificial general intelligence. There's something called like Bayes law. Right. There 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 are purposely perfectly general purpose things that, that already exist. And you know, the fact that you can use basically a library and pass a bar exam or in fact any exam, well the reason we have exams is to find out how much you've learned as an ape, you know, like because you already are an ape, you're good at the you know, competing part and all that stuff, but you're not necessarily good at memorizing a lot of laws, right? So, oh, surprise, a computer can memorize these things, okay. 
but the, the you know, and, and, but the, um, trying to for, force myself to state, it's such an interesting topic, isn't it? Anyway, so the, the point is that, um, have I, maybe I should let you, I, 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 uh, I, I feel like I've gone, I had a really important point and I've gone too far down a rabbit hole. Remind me the question again. The, 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 <laughs> the, the, um, that we don't have to worry about AGI as being like godlike. Oh, right, but right, well. right, right, right. Because super intelligence, super intelligence is learning how to learn, and then, uh, and then you have these exponential changes. You should see the exponential changes we've already been going through. Like every era, if you look at the compute, I mean every era of the computing times, so since 1950, it all has these exponential curves, and we've been handling it. Right, and actually, if you go back further, and you you know, printing press, horses. When we got horses, had to totally change the way we governed. You know, and and I do think that. Um, uh, so back to this thing about what jobs. Um, I was honestly panicked about this thing about oh no, there's not going to be paralegals. So how are we going to have partners for law firms, right? You know, because it takes 20 years to train up. And I was co-authoring a paper about legal agency and how what a stupid idea it is for AI with a law genius from Cambridge. And when I told him, oh, I am worried about this one thing, he just started laughing his butt off. And he said, are you kidding? That soul-destroying work that those guys do for 20 years, all the smart people leave, like, like me. I went into Cambridge instead because I couldn't take it, right? So, so he's like, then the guys who are left, their partners, they not only, you not only have to pay for all those partners and all the, the stables full of paralegals, then you have to pay, they get me to come in and actually solve the problem for them. So you're also paying extra money for the geniuses. If you got rid of those years, then you would be keeping people, you'd have smaller, more agile law firms. You'd have wider access to, to really great law because the good people could stay in. They wouldn't have to do the soul-destroying part, right? And I think in general what we see is automation lowers the cost of things, but sometimes when you lower a cost, then more people will buy it. And that's what's happened like with, for example, ATMs. With, eight, with, with automated teller machines, once you could take the money from the wall, that made every uh, place, what do you call those places? B branches of a bank cheaper. And so then the branches, so then the banks could put branches closer to you. So there's many more smaller branches. So currently, this won't be true forever given all our phones and everything, but currently there are more bank tellers now than there used to be, right? And it's because there's more branches and they each have a few. And they have more interesting and higher paid jobs than they used to have before they were competing with machines, right? What there aren't anymore is, is uh, high paid bank, uh, branch managers because now the branches are smaller things. So the banks are still saving money. Anyway, it's complicated, but that's my point. We find ways to employ each other. Just like we didn't stop playing chess when computers won chess, you know, and, and we don't stop doing pub quizzes just because we could Google things. That's, uh, that's, that's very, very comforting. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a book, Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner, I don't know if you've seen this, it's based on a book uh, by Philip Dix, and it's called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Um, and so I'm, I'm happy uh, not to worry, I don't have to worry about psychotic and schizophrenic AI tonight. Uh, but with that, I would like to Come back to what you said earlier, uh, Chris. Um, we have to. I think we we all agree that we have to focus more on the human side, and make the whole discussion less about technology. Uh, Chris, 45 years ago, the philosopher Hubert Dreyfus wrote that our risk is not the advent of super intelligent computers, but of sub intelligent human beings. Um, what he meant was that the risky part of AI is not that the machines become more similar to humans, but that humans become more like machines, or precisely that humans adapt themselves um, to the machines and in the process lose some of the things that makes us distinctively human. That sounds like we should have a whole new debate of how do we as humans need to approach technology in the age of ChatGPT, right? Um. Uh, the, the first part of your sentence I like, the second part I don't, uh, okay, I'm, I'm an AI person, right? Yeah, we should all have that discussion um, and, and we should all understand how the statistics work and blah, uh, but that, that's the blue dream of, of a computer nerd. Um, I, think, 
I think that uh, what we really need is humans talking more about how we want society to work, right? Right now, we're, we're, we're becoming an extremist society. The one part of the world is totally egotistical and expects the entire world to uh, adapt to their needs, feelings, whatever, and the other part of the world is a complete swarm, and they say, like, whatever I have to do to fit into the swarm is fine. Um, and, and free society is somewhere in the middle, right? And the, I'm, I'm not sure what brought this on, Trudy. I can say that for the last 150 years in economy, um, we have dealt with indus industrialization, right? And industrialization is actually just one thing. It's using the economies of scale. So if you make more of the same, it becomes cheaper or more efficient. Um, and we've all learned this. We've All of us have learned this in school. How to do something right is you analyze, you standardize, you consolidate, and then you build something. It doesn't matter as if it's a piece of software or a factory or a, a business process or whatever. And this is how it works, right? Now what we've actually done is, and, and I totally agree with you, it's like what we've actually done is we've made people work like machines. Like we've programmed people. And our school system, and I, I'm so glad that you said this, is our school system is meant to make sure that people who have to work in a factory don't go completely nuts. <laughs> um, that's how it, that's when it was designed and how it was designed. I think it's, it's time to go maybe back or forward, I don't know which, which way that is, um, to actually make people think more about things and deeply and long term. Um, and also find a compromise, like learn to argue, fight, whatever, um, without hitting each other over the head. In, in, in these things, because we have unlearned this, right? And this whole debate that we're having about intelligent machine, extra intelligent machines, machines that outperform people, hey guys, that's the whole point of machines. We have built machines to outperform us. Do you want to be a crane? No, because the crane can lift bricks much better than you can. Right? It out, machines have outperformed us all the time. Now we're getting a bit scared because they're outperforming us in things that we thought were kind of, whoa, difficult. Well, we built better machines, fine. But that does not make us less human. And it, machines do not create anything. And I, if, if I look in, in, into the future, um, I totally agree with the fact that we've always had more jobs. Right? In the end, more jobs came, whatever they were. And if we're looking at our um, lineup of innovation, right? Um, I don't often agree with Peter Thiel, but I agree in this one. Since 1970, we've had not have much innovation, right? And Facebook is not an innovation. That's an acceleration of gossip, and gossip last was useful, useful in the Stone Ages. It's not useful today at all. Right? So the, the, the point is that none of us have the time to actually deal with creating something new. And if you look at what makes people happy, right, there's only two things that actually create endorphin, not dopamine, is the one is that when you make someone else smile, that makes you happy. Like, if you're not a sociopath, you can test this, right? If you're not a sociopath, you will be more happy when you give something to someone than when you receive something, because it makes them smile. And the second one is to make a new experience. And that can be something like be the first to climb Mount Everest or be the first to program the next generation of large language model or whatever. It can be, but it can be something that is just new for you. So many people have climbed Mount Everest. If you try, you're going to be very, very happy if you make it. Um, <laughs> Otherwise not, right? But um, you're, you're going to be happy about this. And I, I personally, I categorize this like there's three categories to me. The, the one category um, of people who contribute something new is actually, um, you can read this. I've said this before, so I'm not saying this because I'm here, um, are artists. And artists are not necessarily the people who use tools to do something creative or paint pictures or whatever. Artists are people who have the audacity to go against the mainstream. Like some, everybody was painting photorealistic pictures, someone painted blue pictures, and in his lifetime they didn't like him much, afterwards they were worth millions, right? Um, artists have the audacity to go against mainstream. You can see this um, happening, for example, when Trump was elected, right? Everybody who was warning that this would be a disaster was the artist community. 
Like all the singers came out and so on. The second part is, is the, let's, let's call them engineers. In German, we call them Tüftler, right? The special type of engineer who, who, who use stuff that's already there and produce something completely new out of it. Um, that's fantastic. My favorite uh, Tüftler is a guy called Mr. Dräger, who created a company, Drägerwerke, in Lübeck. There are now, in, in American English, there's, there's the term Drägerman, which are the fire people, because he, he created a valve that was made so that they could breathe oxygen and would not breathe in smoke. Um, now these guys produce ventilators, they produce uh, filters for tanks, they produce all the fire equipment, diving equipment, whatever. The guy actually built the valve that he then reused for all these things because he wanted a nicer beer with more foam on it, right? Perfect engineer. Um, and the third ones, and, and I've got to say that the third guys that contribute something new are pioneers, right? And we underestimate pioneers. Like pioneers in the olden days were people who um, stepped on a boat uh, and said, let's go sail the ocean and find India and accidentally find America. Or whatever they did. Like, Gulag Humboldt, who's, who walked the, the desert trying to find the source of the Nile and all these, all these type of pioneers that are out there. Basically, there are people who are willing to take or who need to take more risk in order to be happy. Um, right now, because everybody, everything needs to be safe and curiosity can't be like lived because everything needs to be safe. Pioneers, they're still out there but they're so at the edge of society that the only thing that they do is jump in a parachute from a satellite with a bit of advertising on their back, right? Contribution to society zero. Um, we still need the pioneers, right? So these type, this is type of human behavior that is not industrializable. Everything else is kind of industrializable. Can, can I I've not talked about tech now. Can, can I disagree with something? Is that okay? Please, Sorry. in my quest to you run over time, you're very welcome. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I, I promise to make it much shorter. I mean, because I've been agreeing with you before, but there's something you said that I realized was taking something I said to a limit I wouldn't take it. So I don't, uh, maybe I'm not the biggest optimist here. Like I said, I th I'm in a governance school because I think governance is hard right now. Things are changing. And it's not guaranteed that we'll have jobs. We have jobs when we value other people. So jobs are relationship between people. And that's why I thought it was really interesting, the question that the chair was asking at the last, at the last uh, session about, but what about the art? What about the access? What about the salaries? If we diffuse it all too much, who can support themselves still this way? Um, those are hard, hard questions. And I th we don't have to look too far away from here to, it, for people who don't care about human life enough that they would just start a war and just throw away a lot of lives. We saw a lot of that in the 20th century, not just wars, but also deliberate starvation and huge chunks of people. So it, when I, I am very worried, I want to return to the thing you mentioned before, I'm very worried about those people in California, and I'm not just picking on Californians, I some of my best friends live in California. No, but any, seriously, the, the people who think that we do not need education, we don't need to understand, that are hiring their own private militaries and they have their, their you know, building their castles in New Zealand or whatever, there are some people that for whatever, again, psychopathic possibly reasons, there are people that are thinking, we don't need this many people, and climate change is coming, and democracy is failing, um, you know, because they aren't paying their taxes. And, and, then, and, and so we need, to be, we need to expect there's gonna be this event and it's gonna be bad, but we need to be the ones to survive our, our way through. But Realize other, that we are up against people with that mindset and that that can cause problems. We have to choose to have governments that redistribute adequately and make sure that value people. And that's why I'm in Europe instead of America right now. Well, what, what you're describing is the implementation of Atlas Shrugged, right? So, <laughs> so let me back him up. Uh, okay. so, so, no, because he actually said it, right? So first we came, and I said it earlier, first, by the way, there's California people are mostly capitalists, not psychopaths. Well, <laughs> yeah, so, there's a few, there's a, like, a few, I know, a few it, of these people. It, it, can, it can look the same sometimes, but it's capitalism. Anyway, so the, the, interesting, part, uh, the interesting part is, first we came for the, you know, People who calculated by hand, by the way, computer was a job, okay? Computer now is a machine in our generation, but it was a job. Then we came for the secretaries and so on and so forth. And now, finally, we come for creative uh, uh, jobs. And now we are like, oh shit. I, I honestly, society had to change with every technological advance, including cars and electricity and all of these things. Again, the only difference seems to be 
and it could also just be a function of, uh, of our density of population, by the way, is that this is so fast. This is super fast. That seems to be the major change. Um, and the problem here is with governance is the following, and actually that's to add to my comment, is, uh, well, try to regulate AI. China won't, Russia won't. So we would have to honestly have and a global China, China, China has the best AI regulation, which is almost explicitly what the uh, Europe has proposed, against but they are faster. Against their own people, but not against us. <laughs> no, so no, no, no. That's the problem. So China also really cares about having a stable society and, and not having revolutions, and they know that these things happen, and I, they want their people to be happy. So, and, okay, let's... Or they kill the ones they don't care about. I, I will just, I will just, uh, <laughs> let's de 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 depoliticize, but basically there's going to be one country who's going to be the safe haven for whoever wants to create the most aggressive AI, if, if, all, if all, mine, all but one uh, uh, countries agree. That's how it is, right? And so that is the problem with the governance issue. It's not a local, it's not, a, it's not even a, a national thing. It would be a global thing, and that's difficult. No, I, I, I totally agree, um, and we agree with that also with you know chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry, the the aerospace industry, uh, GPS. There's a lot of things that are that are global now, and we do have to negotiate transnationally. But that hasn't made it impossible to negotiate. And yes, sometimes people defect. But the point is that so far. We haven't been stupid enough to wire up a system that could destroy the world, and if we have, nobody's triggered that. But, but um, that I, I, uh, I, I reject this idea that, that there's no possibility of coming to the agreements that we've seen instances of. We are much too slow, and people have already died on coming up with agreements for climate change, right? So I get, I get that, and, and also for like various kinds of pollutants, and there's a million ways we've been too slow. But overall, we've been incredibly successful. That's why there's more people than there's ever been. And so, I'm not saying that's a success thing. We do need to figure out how to actually live sustainably, including with sustainable sizes of population. But I'm just saying this, this isn't intractable, and we have found the GDPR. There's, there's numbers of ways that we have found. I do worry we may have to do something like the Great Firewall for certain kinds of intrusive uh, surveillance. But, um, but I, don't, I, don't, yeah, I don't think it's impossible to do this. No, I... I, I <laughs> can, I, can I jump in or no? Okay, make, make it quick. I'm, okay. I'm, 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 I'm getting afraid of what I'm started here so, because so we're running I've, over time. I've, I've just finished reading Dan Egger's The Every, right, which is the, the sequel to The Circle. I, I recommend this reading to everybody. It, it kind of shows where we're going. Um, it, it's, it's great fun. But I think talking about regulation, right, I, I agree that we have a political problem with regulation because politicians now try to regulate technology. And they have a very hard, because it's very easy to talk about this, right? You can hire an expert, you can bring in you or me or whoever, and we can tell them that the, the LLMs shouldn't be doing this and that. But that's totally not the problem. The problem is what they really need to formulate, and they're totally unable to formulate, is goals. Like, what is the actual goal? What should it look like in the end? Like, forget if this is technology done manually, whatever. What is the goal that you have? And regulating that, that used to be done, Unfortunately, mainly after wars, then there was a goal, and, and regulation was built around the goal. Right now, regulation is be built around methods, and technology is just a method of doing something. Um, and that is stupid, because technology will develop in, another, in a different way, and as you rightly said, uh, if North Korea, North Korea has one of the best cyber teams, right? So one of the, the best teams that hack your phones. Um, and it's super easy to do that, right? Because if you want to build a nuclear bomb, you actually need a lot of technology and a lot of capital. And if you want to run an army, as you can see right now in Europe, you need hundreds of thousands of people. In order to do cyber attacks, you need 50 people. And they need to be pissed at someone. And you just say, like, look, I'm going to pay you a million a year, and I'm going to put you in the mountain, and you're going to do nasty things. And you're going to find these 50 people. The, the, these, these cyber farms are a lot more than 50 people. Well, it depends on what, <laughs> yeah, where you're going, you right? I'm talking about, about the yeah. people who implement the zero days. It's, it's small. Yeah. All right. Okay. I, I would love to listen uh, <laughs> much longer. But I, I, do, I really do want to open up um, the round here. So anyone with questions? Me and you. Him first.
now, maybe? Yeah. My name is Markus Löffler. I will be on the panel tomorrow, number five, and I came here to see what is going on. <laughs> um, I'm here in this city since 30 years, and at the end of this day, I wanted to uh, make a remark rather than a question, <clears throat> which may not be directly related to this, but somehow yes. Here in this city, 130 and 40 years ago, here there was a meadow. And in many other places in the city, there were meadows. There was no industrialization. This Pitler work was created in 1889, and they were producing machines. So it was machine production which was going on here. At that time in Leipzig, there was a rapid development of industrialization 0 uh, 2.0. This gave an explosion to the city in a way, but on the other hand, the people living in this city were very reluctant to accept that new technology. And there was, um, on the other side, a lot of entrepreneurs who wanted to create such factories. And they were desperately searching for people to work here. And in order to uh, cope with this um, ba disbalance, they created 125 years ago here a huge kind of public relation um, uh, event, more or less something like an expo, like in Chicago, like in Paris, like in other cities. And the goal of this um, huge event, which took place in the center of the city, a huge park, uh, was to convince the people living here in this area that industrialization is a good thing and makes a lot of offers for new jobs, for new positions to work here in these factories or in related other disciplines and that there were totally new um, professions emerging. And they went out and showed to the people what kind of professions these would be. So there were demonstration um, uh, places in this uh, Sächsische, Thüringische Industrie- und Gewerbeausstellung. For, sorry for this long title, he will understand. <laughs> now, this led to the fact that Leipzig became a boom town of industrialization. You are here in this place, this earned a lot of money. There are many, many factories like this here which at the end all declined. After uh, World War II, there was the first decline. Then during the German, East German uh, uh, communist uh, government, there was the second decline. And finally, when there was the friendly unification, a peaceful uh, unification, all these factories were gone. I mentioned this because I think, and one thing I have to add, in this rapid industrialization, which was taking place 20, 30 years after the same process happened in England, in Manchester, Liverpool, and there, the same social revolution took place here. So the, f the same increase in uh, professions, but also the impoverishment of the people who lived here. So there were, very fierce protest, protests. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels were here in the city repeatedly. There was the foundation of the Social Democratic Party with 6,000 members the, in Germany, the largest ever created uh, party at one time. And this I mention only because I think, and we can dwell on this tomorrow, we should not only look at intelligence, but we should look at social intelligence. There is something to do. Don't be too positivistic on just producing new machines, which I'm really a great fond of. I'm a professor here at the university. 
what we should keep in mind that there is also a responsibility to deal with it. It's not just governance. It's something else. It's beyond this. It's about yeah. the ethics. That was my point. Yeah, I think I think uh, uh, you, you didn't fail to mention that in, in a sense because you, you were drawing on the human aspect uh, quite quite heavily. Uh, Clara, you wanted to. Thank you. Um, I have so many questions, but I'm going to let's narrow it down to one. Joanna, if I may, um, I actually for the last couple of years I worked as a diplomat in Silicon Valley, mitigating between policymakers, technologists, and artists, which was an impossible task. So I agree, governance is the linchpin. It's where it's at right now. Um, we talked briefly, you mentioned non-proliferation. Um, we, yeah, global regulation of AI. One of the things that I remember back then when legislators from the European Union came to Silicon Valley and wanted to have a conversation with uh, the big fours or, you know, even the beginnings of open AI was, was um, when they drafted the white paper in its very early stage that is now concluded in the AI Act. So I'm really curious to hear thoughts about that. Um, was always like the question of preemptive legislation. Like how do you come to the point to anticipate harm? How would you be able to predict that some technology will be used for nefarious purposes? How, how do, you, do you really shield your citizens against harm? It is an impossible question to ask. And so, um, not stifling innovation, the classic European, European conundrum and <laughs> paradox, but at the same time making sure that harm is mitigated. And at this point, we're, not, we're operating on a scale that is, like, harm is so much more harmful than just a car accident of one individual, right? Like, the implications are so much more nefarious and so much drastic, so governments is extremely important. And I just want to um, uh, tie this back to one question that that like we concluded on this panel and we can now carry over to this one. Education, like how do you educate regulators, policymakers? We can now see this in Congress and <laughs> what a car crash this always is, but um, what are your recommendations? Why do you work in the field of governments coming from technology? This is a deliberate choice. So what do you, what do you tell to us policymakers? What should we do? Okay, I'll, I'll back that up uh, and try to do it quickly because I know I've talked before too much. Um, it's very, why I'm working in a governance and policy school was because um, people kept asking my opinion and I was useful and it was snowballing and I was spending all my time there and I realized quite often I was only in the room because of that one paper I wrote as a student, throwaway paper, oh, people are over-identifying with my robot. So, Hardly anyone was in the space, and so I was invited to the table in the first place, and I was repeatedly invited because I knew the biology of intelligence, so at least I could guess something, right? And so, um, so that, and I could also tell them how AI was actually made, so I was, there was people saying, oh, you know, no one programs AI now, it programs itself from data. This is just false, this is false. There's always a human involved. Someone decides which algorithm, which data, they make architectural decisions, they buy the hardware, there's a million places where people, so anyway, I helped them because I had systems engineering, but also because I knew biology. Eventually, when I kept getting called back in the room, and I have never been able to organize this, incidentally, sometimes I think, oh, I really need to tell someone, hopeless. But when you, I kept getting called in the room enough of the time that I decided I needed to be somewhere where there was real political science, governance, people understood these things, and data science, so we could test the theory that I was, I was p posting out. So that's why I moved into governance school. Um, sorry, that was the, part, the short part at the beginning to answer the, question, the quick question. Oh, what we need to educate these people. This is one of the things that I need to educate the technologists all the time. You, these, the, you, you see people asking stupid questions in, or in Congress, right, and also in the European Parliament. I, I was testifying to a bunch of people in the European Parliament, and it was supposed to be my class, so my class were watching in another room, and I was really happy. There was a lot of smart people. You got to look at who's holding the pen, right? But a lot of great questions were asked, but the students were all horrified by the three or four, you know, incredibly stupid questions were asked. They make it in the news. But the point is, that's not, the legislatures just have to update what we need, what, what's important and reallocate resources a little bit. Most things we do is something called product law. We, as a sector, figure out how to govern. We, you can't, oh yeah, I remember the third point now, good. So, so we don't have to get them to understand every aspect. They don't have to be Jeff Hinton to be able to govern. They need to say, 
Jeff Hinton, what do you do? What do you think is obvious? You know, Yashua, what do you think is obvious that, that what does your sector realize now that they should have known before? Right? You publish that in trade journals and then you apply that. That's called due diligence. You have to do at least what your sector has figured out. And for reasons that we could go into, but I, don't, I know I don't have time, America has not been applying the law it innovated against this particular sector. It thinks this sector is a magic bullet or something um, because it is no longer in the position of economic uh, ascendancy that it was after World War II. So we, we have to get back to basically applying the laws we already have and that's all we've been doing in Europe and we are doing a pretty good job. Actually, most of the things that are gonna hold these companies to account are already law. The AI Act is almost a red herring. It just says this boring thing I just said about you know, keep track of what you do. Right? The Digital Services Act is what these people are afraid of and why they're saying federal government protect us, protect us, we're really important and we could destroy the world and if you don't protect us then China will destroy the world. Honest, you know, or, or North Korea, right? So that's what, that's what they're doing. I, what was the, the, the very first question was the, right, yeah, we can't. And I gotta tell you, the number of people that think because we have AI, we, that if we make any mistake it's culpable, don't, no, no, don't go there, it's not magical thinking. All we can do is the best we can do. So, and, yeah. so we can, right? So very, very, very quick, quick. Yeah. Chris and, and, and Gerald, Gerald, please start, but, but we, we wrap it up. Okay. I'll, I'll share a personal experience, right? So I had this phone call in my office, Ms. Merkel was calling, and uh, first of all, I went down to the cafeteria and said, which of you jokers did this? <laughs> um, then it, I found out it was actually her, and she asked me to join this digital council, and having her on the phone, you can't say no, right? So you say yes. Then you go to Berlin for the first time, you think like, how do I get out of this very quickly? Because who wants to waste his time with the, the cabinet? Um, because when you see them on television and you read about what they do in the papers and you follow the debates in parliament, you're like, oh man, what a friggin' sandbox. Like this is like kindergarten people. Um, and then you meet these people behind closed doors and you find out that they're actually very smart and knowledgeable. And most of them actually care about doing the right thing. And this is when, when uh, I personally said, like, I should be involved here because obviously if you do this behind closed doors, then, then stuff is happening. And if even like the, the, the experience that I made personally is that, of course, you come with all these great ideas that should be changed in digital legislation, blah, 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 and then you find out something very, very simple, um, like writing into a general um, Anordnung, whatever that is, like a general uh, statement to all the bureaucracy that is out there that um, nothing needs to be printed anymore. It can be sent via secure email, right? That is such a huge change to the entire bureaucracy. Like the sing a single sentence in, in a uh, legislative paper is totally crazy. Um, and what I think, I, I totally agree with you, right? There's no preemptive legislation. I actually, most of those backfire totally. Um, but the, the point that we have here is, w there's a single thing we have to ask our politicians to do, right? It, it, politics gets blamed for everything, blah, blah, but what they, or what we have to, uh, your question was much smarter. You ask us, what do we need to teach them? Okay, we need to teach them that Machiavelli might have been the most powerful man on earth for a brief time, but he died alone and poor. <laughs> and they should stop behaving like Machiavelli when they're out in parliament and just behave well when they're behind closed doors. Like start thinking long term when you're but, out but there. But Chris, yeah. uh, when Machiavelli died, when shortly before he died, he also said, I, I don't wanna go to heaven because they're only monks. I wanna go to hell, they're all the emperors. <laughs> So, so can you make it I, really quick? Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not sure if, if uh, the belief uh, or the I religiousness mean, in our politics yeah, is so, I, so I high. make it really quick and easy. Yes, you can predict and you can prevent. Sorry. As a scientist, there are two very simple methods of how we do this. Fundamentals and measurements. How do we prevent accidents on the street? Don't go further, faster than 120. Oh, no, Germany doesn't have that. Anyway, d how do you prevent, how do you prevent uh, people slaughtering themselves? Well, your blade can be this. Oh, but not this, which is measured in centimeters here and in inches somewhere else. That's how you do this. So we will have to measure intellectual capacity of models, which is possible. Not going into this here right now. We will have to, uh, we will have to think what are we allowing 
in the future and how much compute, how much energy should these things take and so on and so forth. So engineering discipline and scientific discipline allows us to do that and unfortunately, and that is my criticism, that is absolutely not part of those discussions. All right, I, I, I just have to stop the discussion here. Um, that was that was incredibly valuable, really, really interesting. Although I have to say, uh, what does it say about me that the thought of being a crane made me very happy? Uh, so anyway, there's hope. Uh, I think if we all believe, if we all believe, oh, thank you for laughing. Uh, <laughs> I think if we all believe in our in our autonomy and believe more in us and don't go down the route of of, uh, of trusting in some godlike AI. I think it, it is in, in our hands, right, to, to shape the future, as, as you all say. So thank you very much for your time. It was, it was very, very, very interesting. Um, yeah, wrap it up.